racism, and it was a predominantly white crowd. Protesting wasn't led by black folks. Black folks didn't say come out. You had tens of thousands of white folks protesting racism. And so if anything that this crazy guy has done, he's kind of brought us all together in a way across category in opposition to him. So anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Congresswoman. I know that um, uh, you just got in and uh, from Washington, you got to head on. So uh, anytime you need to um, step on out, please do. But thank you okay. for having joined okay. us. I think it's very, very, very important that uh, we saw something kind of amazing uh, and um, uh, uh, in this in this video, we saw um, your colleague, um, Congresswoman uh, Maxine uh, Waters, Auntie. who um, who uh, has changed amazingly little uh, in, in, in 29 years. Who um, who who was um, in many ways the linchpin and the articulator and and uh, of calling out calling uh, 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 out power as well as speaking to the people and saying we can do this together we can we can co coalesce in a positive way and getting response and most recently she has also coined yet another term she's reclaiming our time reclaiming her okay. time reclaiming her time let's reclaim our time let's talk a, a little bit more about this again my name is charles stewart and uh, i just um just retired from um from working for seven years for uh, state senator holly mitchell who represents much of much of South LA today, uh, but at the time when um, in 1992 when this happened, uh, I was working for the then state senator, also Diane Watson. Um, and there was an election going on right then at that point for county supervisor with Yvonne, and she was engaged in that election um, race with um, with uh, Yvonne, com former congresswoman Yvonne Brathwaite Burke. And what I remember was really really important at that time was that a a truce had just been negotiated between gangs, the, 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 the Crips and the Bloods had just initiated conversations to negotiate a truce to end some of the gang war violence that was going on on our streets as a result of desperation when, um, when, when this trial erupted. And I remember the day that it happened, I was uh, in her district office uh, in, on Crenshaw and Vernon, and she was on a plane like so many legislators on their way back from Sacramento, and I had written two speeches for her. One speech was in case the, um, the verdicts in Simi Valley were, were substantial and um, found, uh, found the officers substantially guilty and recommended substantial sentences, and one which recommended, which the senator might deliver in the event that they, that they got a slap on the wrist. Nobody expected complete exoneration. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Mm -hmm. It took us all completely by surprise. And I remember standing in the office and watching television at the time and saying, they're going to burn this town exactly. to the ground. Mm -hmm. And I sent everybody in st at staff home that day and stayed for as long as, as I could. I was up on the third floor and saw the fires going up. I, I know so many of you did as well. And, and, and growing fear for the city in which I'd grown up. And so that's, that's some of the backdrop and some of the history here. I'd like to ask our authors, our, our, our uh, directors here and conceivers, um, the thing that was most salient to me in tonight's film as part of an ongoing conversation, not merely as history, because I think it is more than that, and I think we need it to be more than that, is that, as the Congresswoman noted, what was amazing then was that we, for the first time, we had documentation. We had video documentation. They couldn't just say police brutality is a figment of the black imagination anymore. That was the whole point to us. That would, Now we will get justice. Now people will take us seriously. And I thought that device which leads to the cell devices each of us is equipped with tonight, that that device, technology, would carry us forward, buoy us forward. And that was so important to me. And it's so important to me that, that, that you chose to focus on footage, raw footage. But I'm wondering whether or not another device actually proved more important than we didn't notice at the time, and that was radio. And that was 
the people of America who felt that since the 60s, America was being taken away from them. The Rush Limbaugh crowd, the ditto heads, who resorted, who felt that they had lost the universities and lost television and lost film and resorted to radio and began to use that as a device to create a new kind of resistance that we see emerging today that went from radio and went back to television in the form of Fox and then from there to the Tea Party and from there to Congress in the form of the Freedom Caucus these devices are tremendously powerful in our lives. Why and how do you choose to focus on raw footage, given the fact that there's been so much commentary, so many reports, so, in, so much analysis of what's gone on? Why did you take us back? What was, what was, what was your thinking? Big question. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think in its simplest form, so the people, the individuals who actually conceived of the film are Jonathan Chin and Simon Chin, our producers. They knew the 25th year anniversary was upon us, and they had sold through the project to National Geographic prior to us being involved. They came to us with a sizzle reel, um, they put together some footage um, and some music behind it, and sent that to us. In watching it, so Dan, I was 12, I think Dan was 13 in, in 92 during the civil unrest. In watching it, I think there was a flood of memories for us. Um, you know, there's a couple things that obviously stood out. Uh, King's speech, uh, um, King's beating. Um, and then in addition to those moments, there were a couple of things that really stuck out to us. One of which was the moment where... Um, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Art Washington, and he's, it's in the second act of the film where he's wielding a hammer, he's saying, I come from the ghetto too, this is not right. And there is something so, um, for a lack of better terms, inherently pure and raw with the emotion. It wasn't, it was an unfiltered, untapped, untarnished emotion. And we thought to ourselves, well, if we can preserve the integrity of that over the course of the entire film, um, then maybe we're actually adding, um, we're having a potentially different type of conversation when it comes to race, class, and injustice. And the conversation we were hoping to achieve is to have it through a lens of empathy. How do we humanize the experience, but yet still tell the story? And so we decided um, maybe the best way to try to do that is if we can do that where, there, where we let the material that was captured speak for itself and not have it filtered through some form of analysis, some form of retrospect. Because things are different in retrospect. But if we can immerse you as an audience into what that experience was, you get an opportunity as audience members to feel that, not have someone else tell you how to feel, tell you how to think. Um, and so when we propose that idea of not doing something that's archive heavy, but rather archive only, um, Jonathan and, and Simon didn't flinch, and, and the network said, that's great. And then we realized we had a, a serious uphill battle. <laughs> Um, and then that's, that's kind of what the foundational um, uh, uh, motivation was behind the approach. I think just